Um, so happy Earth Day to everybody. I'm, uh, it's kind of a privilege to give this lecture, uh, Vicki's fourth, fourth spot and uh, thinking through uh, this would be an appropriate thing for Earth Day. What I want to talk about is really the intersection of material science and sustainability and, um, and, and that'll be kind of, kind of clear as we go. It'll be, I think, a little bit different take on the subject than you may have seen before. And what I hope to do is uh, bring this back to your, your quantitative skills as engineers that you're developing and try to figure out how that ca casts onto sustainability. Um, so first of all, uh, I hope everyone is doing well. This is a tricky time for everybody. Uh, absolutely everybody I know is, is uh, struggling or changing with, with this in various ways. And just know that um, you know we, we as a university do, do care about the students, want to see the best for all of you, recognize that there are sacrifices and uh, this is all difficult. So there are resources, the university is trying to do that. You talk to your uh, departmental academic advisors, talk to your, uh, the instructors in this course, reach out to any of us if there are things that, 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 that uh, can be helped with. And um, as you probably see on the front page of the, uh, the, the Lantern this morning, even the university has some, has, has been able to re secure some federal resources to try to help students. So uh, we recognize this is tricky and do reach out if, if anybody is, is struggling. The other reach out thing is uh, feel free in this lecture to, uh, uh, to uh, use the chat to bring things forward. Uh, we'll monitor that and um, I understand I think uh, uh, the TAs or somebody will, will kind of bring that forward to me as we, as we go, maybe, maybe Vicki, and um, feel free to, to do that. So, you know, a lot of this that we're going through right now is, is interesting in that it's an intersection between the technical world, the policy world, and the political world. And th there are things that are, you know, values, motives, and logic. And this is kind of where, you know, shows the limitations of what engineering can and cannot do. And there are always some kind of basic questions that we're struggling with right now regarding uh, personal liberty and uh, public safety. For example, we do a pretty good job with trying to control guns, try to not have people shoot, but still have people have the right to own and, and bear arms. Um, similar issues go with drunk driving. You know, should we have a zero drinking tolerance? We have this 0.08% uh, blood alcohol level, which is seen as a reasonable compromise. Uh, vaccinations, ability to pollute. Uh, people, some people might like to think it's uh, their absolute right to uh, basically create as much CO2 as they might like by driving cars way bigger than they might need or flying a lot. These are questions we all have to think about, I think, fairly deeply is how, how our personal liberty and, and needs of society come together. Um, and I think engineers are really in a very interesting place in this. Number one, uh, you all are developing the quantitative tools to analyze these problems. And secondly, we're in a place where engineers develop tools that can actually be used to make things better, that can actually give us probably better liberty and ability to live better. And I hope you all take that seriously. It's really, uh, you, 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 you budding engineers, nobody in a better position to make these things happen than you guys. And please take that seriously. And then also in this time of weirdness too, it's a good time for introspection and thinking differently. And uh, you can go back to books like uh, you know, Thoreau on Walden Pond, where isolation, you know, allowed him to think more clearly. Uh, Newton was able to develop calculus while he was waiting out the plagues. So, you know, all of you think about this and you know, use the time to reflect and read and, and all of that and, and, and think about how you might uh, uh, use the rest of your lives to do, to do good things. It's a, a once in a lifetime experience, I hope, that we're all going through right now. So put it to the best use you can. So the other thing I want to point out is you just, again, further with the engineering profession, you know, there is kind of the Hippocratic Oath where doctors are supposed to save lives. Engineers also have oaths like this. There's an engineer's creed. Um, I come sort of from a family of engineers. My dad is a an engineer. My kids are all engineers from Ohio State uh, doing well with it. But, you know, kind of the idea is as an engineer, you should devote the talents that have been given to you that have kind of come from lots of people thinking about this over years. And try to do this for the betterment of mankind to be 
honest in what you do to do things for, because they're the right things, not just because they're expedient things and because they're the things that, that give give money, not to say that uh, you, know, you, you shouldn't be able to live well and have a good standard of living, but you, you want to do things in an ethical way. And I think things we're going through right now point to a lot of that. So, and there's also, I think, a very interesting thing going on with COVID-19 that actually lines up very in a very interesting way with sustainability. Uh, right now, there's a problem that's in front of us. There have been a lot of people that have said we should be thinking about what happens when the next pandemic comes. It is one of these nominal once in a hundred year sorts of things. The last one we went through was, was roughly a hundred years ago, last big pandemic. We know these things will happen with some regularity. And um, smart people recognize this. We should plan for this. We should try to understand it. But we also don't know how these things will, will play out. So in a lot of ways, this COVID thing that we're going through is a lot like greenhouse gas issue, but maybe happening about a hundred times faster. Um, things are happening. We don't know exactly how this is gonna play out with respect to greenhouse gas. We know things are accumulating the planet. We know they will warm the planet. There's, there's science, anecdotal evidence. There's really no counter evidence that increasing um, CO2 and other greenhouse gases uh, will not warm the planet. We know that will rise sea level. Um, we don't know how this is going to affect biodiversity. We don't know how this will affect sea, sea level in, in detail. And there's a lot we don't know. And there's a lot going on with COVID like this right now too. There's a lot we can predict. There's a lot we know. But boy, when we start, start thinking about all the complicated inter interrelation things, it's really hard to, to figure out where it goes. Um, the other thing I want to be, have you be wary of, particularly as you consume media, as you consume the messages that come from, from various organizations, most of which really want to do the right things, is do think carefully, do be aware of greenwashing, do be aware of, of groups trying to think about their own uh, uh, self prerogatives first, and, um, and be quantitative about thinking about are you just doing something or are you doing something meaningful? Activity is not the same thing as accomplishment all the time. And kind of through the early stage of this, you know, a lot of people have been thinking about PPE, personal protective equipment. Um, face masks are part of it. Face masks are maybe one of the most, the easiest things to do. Uh, but we should have probably been thinking more deeply for a long time and thinking about, uh, about also uh, not just the shields, but, but the, the masks that you might wear, shields versus masks being different, the shields being far easier than the masks because the masks have to actually filter uh, to, to, to high levels. You have to understand what you're filtering against. The personal protective equipment that we have, we have actually have, do not make a lot of that fabric in the United States anymore. A lot of it has to be imported right now. That creates a problem. And these are problems we've known about for a long time. So you have to have some foresight you have to be aware of what's really a marketing message versus really doing something well. And again, the training you all get as engineers is, is I think pretty important in all of that. Okay, so let me get on to, to sort of the main course of all of this. And let me talk about sustainability here on Earth Day. And the goal today is really to, to ask questions rather than give solutions and try to give you some tools and ways of thinking about things. And thinking about are we are what we're doing really help or do we just feel better? And I think that's an important thing to think about. And then we also have to think about that we do live in sort of a closed system. In chemistry, you learned all about closed systems. The closed system we have is pretty big, but it is an absolute closed system. And we do have conservation of mass within this, conservation of elements. And things move around and where they and we can predict where they will end up in this very large and complicated system. So here's my best try at, at trying to simplify this a little bit and understand where CO2 comes from and goes. Basically, carbon has been with us, you know, it's kind of stardust from, from thinking way back. And CO2 exists in the atmosphere, it gets absorbed in vegetation. Vegetation uh, brings it brings it in, makes it part of it. When those trees fall over, um, they can end up in things like swamps. Over millennia, that turns into things like oil and coal. That process of 
pulling carbon out of the atmosphere into trees, those trees laying down, getting dirt put over them, uh, takes, takes millennia to, to take place and it ends up with oil and coal and these hydrocarbons it is burning dinosaurs, it is burning uh, forests of old. And then we can extract that relatively quickly. And right now we know we are extracting it faster than we can burn it right now. And that's caused oil prices to crash, which is, which is also fairly interesting. And that turns into oil, that oil can power our airplanes, power our cars. It's also very important in uh, all kinds of industrial production. And that actually releases CO2 back into the atmosphere that can also be sequestered back into trees. It also can be brought into the oceans. And we know that the oceans actually hold several times more CO2 than the atmosphere does right now. And that's causing the oceans to become acidified and that's causing wreaking havoc on things like coral reefs and endangering biodiversity. And we don't quite know where all that will end right now. So that's kind of the big picture of where this is. We know that this is a complicated problem, as I've alluded to already. We have, uh, we, we have economic issues, design issues, social, political, and even if we know what the right things to do are, getting that into policy, getting that into laws and everything is a very difficult thing. But I think you, the group here is, is engineers, uh, you can be quantitative, you can do useful things with this and figure out what really are better and worse design alternatives and, and what is the best way we can live well without doing long-term damage. So over the past several years, there's been you know, quite a bit of interest in being green and doing the right thing and thinking about recycling and thinking about hybrid cars and electric cars. And I think a re reasonable question is, well, how, how well have we been doing with that? And if you look at the data, I think the answer is we haven't been doing very well. I, I was born here about 1961, I was born in 1961, not about. And um, back when I was born, the, our, our parts per million CO2 were about 320 parts per million. And since then we're up to somewhere north of, of 400 parts per million. And not only that, but the slope of the curve has been rising. And back here in 2006, Al Gore did his big PowerPoint tour, Inconvenient Truth. And you can see since then, you know, even since then, the slope of the curve seems to be rising. That's over one, basically one lifetime, not even a full lifetime, hopefully. And um, what we see happening over the last thousand years, we can put that into context. We've been here between about uh, 280 and 320 up till to lately, and it's shooting up almost straight up over the last thousand years. You can ask, well, isn't this just you know some kind of kind of variation? We can make pretty good estimates based on uh, drilling cores. Uh, Lonnie Thompson at Ohio State is one of the leaders in this, and over on West Campus, there's a, a big freezer that has a lot of the ice cores that he's taken, which is one of the great repositories in the world for for all of this. And we can make estimates over the last almost million years of what's gone on, CO2 and temperature. We can see these things tracked together and it has risen and fallen, but you can see never before has it been above 320, about the level where I was born. Most of the time, high level, high water marks have been around 280. Ice ages have been here around 200. And these things vary and we're getting much higher than that. And there are other greenhouse gases as well. So uh, it, it's, Bottom line, these are things that usually happen over geologic timescales, tens of thousands of years, and we're seeing big changes over decades, which are not even, a, not even close to a blink of an eye in ge geologic time. So we do have to either change this or, or change our response to this. And my personal feeling is we probably, it's too late to really change what's going on. We will suffer quite a bit global warming, much like with COVID, we, the, the, the virus is in the community and we've got to mitigate from the point we're at. I think we're gonna to have to mitigate from the point that we're at right now, but again, that will cause, uh, require engineering and uh, we have to probably mitigate uh, further damage. So the question is, where, where does the CO2 come from? And again, we can be very quantitative about this. 
These are energy flows and CO2 flows look about the same way. I'll show CO2 and energy in the next slide, but this is a, a, what's called a Sankey diagram. This shows where energy comes from, how it's transformed and, and, and where it goes. And we can see most of our energy, biggest part comes from things like petroleum and coal, natural gas, and you can see solar, wind, nuclear, they're, they're, they're growing amounts, but relatively small amounts right now, but growing quite quickly. And these get put out, get used for a bunch of things. Electrical generation is part of that. A lot of this gets used directly and we can see where it goes. And here's residential and commercial together. These represent about a third. And this is what we do to heat, light, cool our homes and businesses. About a third down here is transportation. This is what we use for cars and airplanes and so forth. And roughly about a third industrial. And this is the part that people don't think nearly enough about. It's kind of hidden, and this is really part of where material science fits in. But this is making all the stuff that we use, and it includes things like fertilizer, but also importantly, it includes things like concrete and steel and aluminum and all these things that we use to make up our, our lives. And that's about a third of our energy goes into that. So another way of showing this, um, this is energy use on this side. This is CO2 emissions on this side. What we see here is here's uh, use of buildings is about a third, vehicles is about a third, and here's this, this industrial part broken out in terms of energy. Chemical, chemicals and petrochem is a big part of it. Steel is a big part. Cement is a big part and then other. And then if you turn this into CO2 emissions, Steel uh, is a big deal. Aluminum uh, is, is a, a, a biggish deal and cement is actually a very big deal as well. So that's the that, that's a part that we as materials people can, can have a lot to do with changing and, and, and as, as mechanical engineers choosing materials that have low carbon footprints and so forth is, is can be important. So one thing you might do is say, well, okay, what if we changed and go to really, really sustainable materials? And you know, one way you could do that is, for example, make a, a bamboo bike. And these are things you can buy. There's a few companies that will sell you bamboo bikes out there. And you can see, if you look carefully, there's still a lot of, a lot of metal on this. I believe this is aluminum and the, the bamboo gets put into this. And maybe you save up to about two kilograms of aluminum on this by replacing it with bamboo. And as I'll show you later, we can figure out how much energy it takes to make that aluminum. It's about 200 megajoules per kilogram. And that amount of energy is about the same amount of energy that's embodied in six gallons of gasoline. So, so you could make a decision to, make a, to buy yourself a bamboo bicycle. Um, but if you have to drive to someplace like Mansfield and back to actually get that, uh, you've probably burned at least six gallons of gasoline. You've negated any, any savings you've had here. And you can also make other choices, drive a little less, bike a little more, maybe you bike more on this. Um, but if the bamboo doesn't necessarily last so long, if you could have got 10 years out of, a, out of an aluminum bike and only get two years maybe out of a bamboo bike, um, that if, not saying these are less less uh, durable, but if they were, those are things you have to you have to consider. So these are um, difficult difficult computations to make, but they are things we can think about in a in a, in a careful and quantitative way. The other thing I want to point out is you can kind of recognize also that. The, the, the CO2 is an interesting thing in that it, it's very concentrated. The carbon is very concentrated in uh, places in the earth where we mine the oil and the coal. Then we put it into our cars and our airplanes and our plants. It comes out, is effluent, is exhaust of some, at some par point. And then it gets put into the atmosphere and, and diffused quite a bit. So a question is, might, you want, might we be able to pull this back out of the atmosphere? And the answer is, well, that's not really so easy. Could you make a gizmo that would suck air in and pull the carbon dioxide out? And um, that, that's not so easy to do either, and I'll, I'll tell you why. And that's when you take petroleum. Petroleum looks a little like polyethylene or something like that. It's basically a hydrocarbon. You take that hydrocarbon, uh, burn it with oxygen, and the two primary products you have are CO2 and, and water vapor. 
These are both things when I was growing up were thought to be completely benign. CO2, not a big deal. Water vapor, still not a big deal. But, but this exhaust gas comes out at about 12% CO2. So tailpipe, permission, tailpipe emission sits here at about 120,000 parts per million CO2. There's a lot of CO2 coming out of the tailpipe of your plant, of your, of your, of your airplane. But then atmospheric carbon is sitting at about 410 parts per million CO2. So when you put it into the atmosphere, it's, it's about 130 thousandth as dilute in the atmosphere as it is coming out of your tailpipe. So it's like taking one drop of something and putting it into a gallon and letting that diffuse and say, okay, I wanna pull that back out. It's very hard to do that after that's diffused. So pulling things out of the atmosphere is difficult unless you have you know, so you have some kind of sucking mechanism everywhere and trees are about as good as we get for that. So once it's left, it's really, really hard to get it back in. But if you can sequester it at the tailpipe or at the plant level, that's good. Um, electric cars are really good things. Ways of, of pulling this out of plants are a really good thing. But what's really difficult is things like airplanes. Once it's left, that, that's something we don't have a very good solution for. So point I'd like to make is we are making really, really good progress towards an electrified economy. Engineers and material scientists are making great progress towards things like solar cells, batteries, electric powered vehicles. There's issues here with, with respect to uh, all the uh, elements that have to go into high, high uh, permanent magnets. There's a lot of rare earth elements that so we will have trouble making. Lighting, LEDs are way more efficient. Heating and air conditioning, heat pumps are pretty good. But things that are really hard right now are things like, like air transport. It's, nobody has a design for something that could take you a long distance in, a, in an airplane with batteries because the batteries are so heavy. That might work for short flights, but for very long flights, that's a problem. And another thing we don't have very good answers for is primary material production, making steel, making aluminum, making fertilizer, all of these things. So that's what I wanna kind of pivot into next is get into uh, some of these issues with respect to how we, how we make stuff and how we can analyze that process. So, um, so here's uh, what I'd like to do is go to a product life cycle and think through, think through this approach. And this is something that comes from Mike Ashby, who's a professor at, at Cambridge. And he thought this through in a very nice and simple way where we take natural resources, we make materials out of it. For example, if we're making steel or aluminum, we get metal ores out of the ground and we take those metal ores and, and turn them into products. And by the way, it usually takes on the order of about one to 200 pounds of, of stuff out of the ground to make a pound of primary metal. So there's a lot of waste along the way. So what we do is we take our natural resources, add energy, add feedstocks, and end up with usually a lot of waste and the waste can out actually outnumber, uh, outmatch the amount of material we've actually produced. Then what we do is we, we make a product out of that primary material. You can make it some steel, you wanna make that steel into a car. Again, the steel has to be transported some way, energy and feedstock, lubricant, paints and things like that come out. You end up with a product and again, a, a big steaming heap of waste. We use the product, if you make a car, you're going to use that car. Again, things like fuel has to go in, other feedstocks have to go in, and waste is created once again. Eventually that product comes to the end of its life. You're going to dispose of it, and you've got many options at that point. You could put that product back into the landfill, again, just creating waste. You could end up combusting it. That's actually not always a bad approach. Uh, a beverage bottle, something like a PET beverage bottle, isn't chemically that different from oil. If you could burn it and compost to get the energy value out of it, that's not very different than what we do with most of the hydrocarbons that come out of the ground. Not a bad solution. We could recycle it. That's a good way of doing things. We, we, we like that. We could refurbish and upgrade that part. That's another good way to do things. Or we could reuse it. And all of this, putting this together is what we call a life cycle assessment. And that's something that is important. And I'll go through the, the uh, uh, elements of a life cycle assessment in just a little while. So before I do that, what I wanna talk about is, is, is at the very beginning of this, when we take our natural resources and make a material, uh, we, end up, we end up 
putting energy in and waste out. I want to talk a little bit about that process for a few discrete materials. As material scientists, we don't talk nearly enough about where our materials come from, and I want to say a little bit about that. So this is, in, this is what we talk about in terms of embodied energy. This is what we mean by the energy needed to make a material. So if you have like a nice granite countertop, uh, granite is uh, something you might use for countertop. You can slice that out of, uh, out of a mine and then you slice it and transport it and you're done. So that, that's a process. It's mostly cutting and transportation cost at that, at that point. Um, the second material I like to think about is, is, is cement. Cement is the stuff that basically holds concrete together and, um, and what we end up doing to make cement is we mine silicates out of the ground. We basically heat them up to tremendous temperatures, about 1400 degrees C. That ends up pulling water and carbon dioxide out of the silicate, gives us cement. We mix that with, with water and that can be used to hold uh, particles together. Uh, and, and, and then that, those particles that get held together is what we call concrete. It's a mix of cement and aggregate. That, that's concrete and that takes a lot of, um, uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, waste also to, to create. Um, and I'm just looking at the comment here. Uh, yeah, I mean, co combustible waste uh, is a growing concern. And, um, but again, we want the energy out. When we combust anything, there are concerns with it to, to answer that. But maybe we'll get to some of that towards the end. But a big point in this, this is one of these things where there's very seldom nice, clean, easy answers to any of this. It's to live well, we create entropy in thermodynamic terms, and um, that causes, causes issues. So the, the next, um, next thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is, is steel, where, where steel comes from and how we use steel. And what we end up doing is taking iron oxide out of the ground, usually with a lot of other stuff. It takes a lot of stuff coming out of the ground to get uh, high grade uh, ores of any type, usually about 100 pounds of stuff out of the ground to get a pound of steel. And then we react that basically, um, basically with carbon and oxygen to create iron and CO2. This happens in a blast furnace. And uh, just before I say that, one more point I wanted to make on the last slide is it takes about a pound of CO2 production to make a, a pound of, of concrete. In the case of steel, it takes about two, you make about two pounds of CO2 through this reaction per pound of steel that are produced. And again, there's other things that go in here. There's iron ore, coke, which is carbon and limestone go in. Carbon makes the, the limestone makes the slag. Slag helps pull impurities out. And these are big industrial processes that end up doing this. Um, so you're actually using carbon to make the, the, the steel. Um, aluminum is similar. Aluminum, we make we use an electrochemical reaction to make it. We make a big carbon anode, run a current through that. And we end up with this reaction that was actually developed in Oberlin, Ohio. Uh, it, 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 um, uh, I think it was Ohio University. Um, and uh, this is by a guy named Hall. There's a Frenchman named Perot that did something similar in France about the same time. And you have this electrochemical reaction that basically creates aluminum and CO2 at the same time. And it takes several pounds of CO2 to make a pound of aluminum. And again, we can come up with this amount of energy that it takes. It takes about uh, 211 giga, gigajoules per ton of aluminum made, which is almost a factor of 10 more than the amount of energy it takes to make iron from its ore. Aluminum is very reactive, so it takes a lot of energy to make it. But once you have the aluminum, you can recycle it many, many times. It's highly, highly recyclable as, as is steel. Polymers are not nearly so recyclable. So those are the primary processes. Those are the kinds of things that you end up doing. And then we can take that in an aggregate, figure out how much carbon dioxide comes off from all of these processes. And the, the ones that, that, 
produce the most CO2. Steel is the winner. Concrete doesn't take nearly as much, doesn't produce nearly as much CO2 per pound produced, but we make so much concrete that that's also way up there. Cast iron, aluminum alloys are way up there. What we end up making from uh, polymers is, is not nearly so much. And I also want to call your attention, this is a log scale. So these are orders of magnitude, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7. So going from 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8 or any two orders of magnitude, that's 100, 100 times over two orders of magnitude. So these, 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 these top things, steel, cast iron, aluminum, concrete, paper, wood, these are things that really dominate the, um, the amount of CO2 that, that goes into the atmosphere. The other thing we can use for computations, and there's good data out there on this, is the embodied energy, how much energy it takes. And this is the energy in terms of megajoules in per kilogram of material that comes out. And things like titanium, magnesium, tungsten, aluminum alloys have, are very, very energy intensive. Steel, as I said, is about one-tenth as energy intensive as making aluminum, but we make a whole lot of steel. Therefore, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of emission based on this. Polymers actually take a fair bit also. Ceramics can take a fair bit. Important thing is we can use this for understanding, uh, making decisions on, on what are better and worse ways of doing things. So what I want to do is, is run through this process again quickly and, and, and show these are the steps and show how these steps now um, go into a life cycle assessment that we might end up doing quantitatively. What we can do if we're selecting materials, we can go through each of these parts of this. Where does our material come? How much energy does it take? What does it take to manufacture that? What does it take to transport that around? For example, if you're making a, a granite table, tabletop, you import the granite from Brazil. Um, it takes a lot of energy actually to ship that from Brazil across. What does it take to use that? And then how might you end up disposing of that is, is the next important question. So what I want to look at is a few cars. And again, this comes from the, the work uh, from Ashby and his group at Cambridge. And if you look at something like an airplane, airplanes, you can look at them as, as two basic functions. One of them is to transport people from one place to the other. The other thing is you could see them as, as things that are designed basically to turn jet fuel into propulsion. They burn a whole lot of jet fuel. So if you look at the ener energy fraction over their use, the amount of energy that goes into actually producing the materials, manufacturing them, transporting, and all of that pales to how much jet fuel goes through that airplane. It's all, all about how much uh, energy that thing uses, how much jet fuel it uses over its lifetime. That dominates the picture. Cars are, are similar, but I'll show an example in a little bit that actually the amount of energy that goes into making it is significant. You could look at a refrigerator. Again, there's some cost of energy cost of material going in. Um, and if you use good insulation, you can change the amount of energy required on use. Um, structures, Ohio State is big on building structures these days. Um, you can think about how much energy goes into structures and for like a car park, that you're not heating or cooling it. It's largely based on how much energy goes into that. A lot of concrete in something like a, a parking garage. A home, a lot of energy goes into making it. A lot of energy goes into heating and cooling it. And you should also think about this for other things like your rugs and so forth and how easy they might be to clean. So to put this in the context of, of something like an automobile, again, there's two big things. The thing that usually dominates is how much energy that car uses over its lifetime, but there's also a lot of energy that goes into making the thing. You, you use things like aluminum and hot stamped steel, and you, you know about martensite and austenite and all of these things. All these tricks are used, bending is used, plastic strain is used, all these things you've learned this, this semester are part of this, and we really try hard to, to optimize this. So I'd like to do a bit of a, a real example, and this is thinking about, about taking a hood of a car and considering whether we make this thing out of steel or aluminum or carbon fiber, just pick one component and you could do this for any component in the vehicle, if you like. So if we've got a, a hood, we, could, we can find data on this and there's all kinds of data on materials out there. Again, these are log scales, strength varies over many orders of magnitude, density going from, from, from foams to dense metals, again, can change over large orders of magnitude. But if I consider 
making a hood out of steel, aluminum, or carbon reinforced polymer, I can actually save a fair bit of weight. I can cut it almost in half by going to aluminum. And I can cut it further by going to carbon reinforced polymer. The problem with carbon reinforced epoxy is that's a very, very difficult material to, to recycle. Whereas aluminum is very easy to recycle, steel also recycles very well. So there's, there's big environmental pluses and minuses with, with all of those. And aluminum is probably a pretty good selection and aluminum is often used in these, what we call closure panels in, in automobiles. So we can kind of think about um, how much energy it takes to make each component. If I take the mass of each of these, multiply by the embodied energy, I can figure out how figure out how much energy it takes to make each of these components. The carbon reinforced polymer takes the most energy per, per mass, but it's the lightest mass. So it comes out, each of these, you need about 1.8 1 terajoules, I think, to, um, to, 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 to make the part. Whereas steel, you need about 510 megajoules. These are still big amounts of energy we can kind of run through the computation of this. If we go from steel to aluminum, we put more energy into the car, we have to save at least about 1300 megajoules of energy to justify the change. The energy content of gasoline is about 130 megajoules per gallon. So you've got to save about 10 gallons of gasoline over the life of the car by switching that hood out in order to justify the change. Steel requires the least energy to make, but is the heaviest part. The other thing that you should all know is if you burn one gallon of gasoline, that emits about 17 pounds of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So these are, these are very real, <laughs> very real things. It, it takes a lot of, a um, little, little bit of fuel savings can turn into a large change in uh, CO2 savings. So the other bit of data you might need on this in order to do something is, is if you consider a personal automobile, how much energy is saved by reducing mass on a per, per distance driven basis. So, so you can have energy saved in terms of kilojoules per kilogram saved per kilometer driven. And we put that in, we can assume that um, uh, a car is in here about says about 1.5 to 5 big big limits on this but if a car burns an extra three kilojoules per kilometer per kilogram and you have an eight kilogram savings on the hood you have to drive that car about 33,000 miles 54,000 kilometers to reach the break-even point so if you make a car out of steel for the first 33,000 miles you're ahead because you put less energy into it but if you make it out of, out of aluminum over the lifetime of the car, you've done better because you've saved some weight and that accumulates over time. So we can be, go a little further with this kind of analysis as well and look at these transport energies. These transport energies come from Ashby's book, Materials and Sustainable Development. How much energy does it take to, to move something by various modes? It turns out, Things like diesel ocean shipping takes very little energy to move things. Once you get that diesel thing moving across the Pacific, it moves very easily. Uh, helicopters takes a lot of energy to move anything any distance. So it takes a lot of, a lot of energy. A little bit of extra weight costs you uh, a lot. And then air freight is, is also fairly high. Uh, this is why at the airlines, they actually care how much, what the mass of your luggage is because it does cost some energy. And this is part of the reason that you don't see um, in flight, uh, in, in flight sky malls and things like that, that those magazines very much anymore because it costs some energy to ship that all over the place. So here's what we have is, is we can plot this again on log, log scales. This is service life, how far something might go versus uh, the, the transport energy it might take in terms of kilograms per kilogram for in, in kilometer. And something like a long haul or short haul aircraft, they have very high sensitivity on how much energy it takes to ship stuff around. They also have very long service lives. So if you pull one kilogram out, you're saving on the order of 3,000 liters of fuel over the life of an airplane. If you lightweight a 737 by 
a kilogram, you save about 3,000 to 30,000 liters of fuel over that because it takes so much energy to run it and they run so far. If you do things like cars, it's not nearly so important, but again, you can figure out how much fuel you save. If you know the, the price of fuel, you know that for every kilogram uh, you're, you're, you're saving um, a given amount of fuel, turns into a certain amount of money. So you can turn that into metrics for things like buses and cars, uh, it's somewhere between one and a half dollars and, and ten dollars um, per pound saved if you run a car for uh, for uh, if you if you pull one pound out of a car you can save somewhere there over five dollars of fuel over the lifetime of the car with traditional fuel prices right now it's, it's a whole new world at the moment whereas if you save it out of an airplane it's a huge huge savings so what we can do is again we can use a log scale in the middle of this and look at different materials and different things and understand what we use to make what out of so things like concrete is is about as cheap as we can make something that's under a dollar a pound steel is also under a dollar a pound plastic sits here maybe about a dollar a pound magnesium copper carbon fiber these things go up tremendously the high end we have things like gold and platinum these can be ten thousand dollars a pound so point is, you will not go to Walmart and buy a cheap bike that's made out of carbon fiber because the carbon fiber on a per pound basis costs way more than the bike. But if you're making something like a commercial jet or an F1 roadster, race car or commercial satellite, these are things that on a per pound basis are very, very expensive. So we can justify using very expensive materials in them. And usually there's big fuel fuel consumption changes with these also commercial jets and so forth end up being very sensitive to how much weight they are to how much uh, how much fuel they will burn and how much they cost to operate over time so i'll wrap this up we have a few minutes for questions um and um what we see here is we have a net effect of technology and, and it's, it's always interesting we as engineers produce technology we can make things that that use less carbon uh, in making it. We can use thing, make things that are most more efficient. And so we can use less carbon. We're also working on electrification technology. We're also working on more efficient vehicles in all kinds of ways, so electrification, light weighting, and so forth. Uh, often we get into a paradox where if we just make things cheaper and better, we just might make more of them. And that can put us into a position where uh, I think this has sort of happened with, with airline transportation. We've made it very cheap, very affordable, very safe. And now people fly a whole lot. So emissions from, air, from airplanes is, is up tremendously over the years. That's something that, that uh, is kind of a double-edged sword in this net effect of technology. So to sum up this whole thing, um, I think we are in some real trouble with greenhouse gas. Sustainable energy is great. Uh, electrification is great. Some things don't electrify very easily, and two in particular are air, air travel and materials production. Um, air travel over long distances is going to be very difficult by, uh, by electric means for some time to come. Secondly, please make quantitative differences. Make sure you're doing something that's, that's really making a difference, not just making us feel good. We can be quantitative about that. We should be mindful about the choices we make on materials and methods. It is meaningful. It's something we can do to, to change things. And then uh, with the Sankey diagrams and, and, and the big pictures of the closed systems, I wanted to make the point that it's all about the flows. If we're going to limit temperature rise, we've got to, we've got to choke off some of these flows and it will change our patterns. And we've seen big pattern changes through COVID. It's, um, it, it's painful, but, but that's the way change is. Change ha happens with, with some difficulty. Um, we want to live well with, uh, without producing excess carbon if we can. It's difficult. And I think we have to be in a position to speak truth to power and do it in a way that's uh, well, well reasoned and uh, not, not with our own interests, but trying to think about uh, humanity first. So I see there's a couple uh, things that have come up on the chat. I'll have to try to open those up right now. Um, uh, 
Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, one of the questions from one of the TAs is, is, can you comment on the balance between renewable energy and the, envir and the environmental cost of making materials for renewable energy? And it's a good, it's a really good question. Um, and, you know, right now, one of the things that's seen as very green and, and is, is a real step forward are things like uh, electric cars. And they do great things. Um, they can tremendously reduce our environmental footprint there are some very difficult things. If we try to scale this up to the point where we have as many electric cars as we now have um, gasoline powered cars, we will have a real difficult time sourcing the rare earth metals that are required for uh, things like the magnets that go into that. So that's uh, going to be a, a difficult issue. And where do we come up with all the rare earth metals? Can we do other things? Um, there's a lot of room for really good engineering on that. And that's something that we um, have, to, have, to, have, to, have to worry about. Um, next question in the chat, I'm curious in terms of sustainable energy sources, particularly solar effort, solar is only about 20% efficient in terms, of, in terms of electric energy, where do we see solar? So solar is actually a, a huge success story. 20% um, efficient is, and if you look at conversion efficiencies of energy, 20% is, is pretty good, but there's lots of processes we, we run that are way under, uh, way under that. And, but that's, that, that's basically the energy from the incoming light being uh, converted into electrical energy. And if we can get 20% inexpensively, that's, that's tremendous. And if you could start putting that on tops of your houses and so forth, that can make a huge, huge dent. Um, you know, the, the very optimistic graphs I've, that are out there that I encourage you to look at is the um, uh, uh, what, what's going on in terms of price per kilowatt hour on solar, which is one of the big metrics for adoption. That's dropping in a Moore's law like way. Uh, materials innovations are, are part of that. Um, and um, uh, I don't know, Professor Duan Nguyen, if you'd like to speak about that at all, but uh, that, that that's very close to what you think about uh, daily basis more so than me. But um, I think uh, that, that's doing very, very well. But again, there is an embedded energy that's required to basically uh, make the solar cells. It, they, they don't come for free, uh, but uh, you make them once, hopefully they last a long time. You can do the life cycle assessment on them and um, see, see, uh, see how you do. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Glenn, for that. You know, this has been a really great um, lecture and really great questions and gives us a lot to think about. And I don't want to take up, you know, obviously too much of your time um, and your guest lecture time, but... Uh, oh, it's fine. We got five minutes left. I don't have anything else to say, but I'm, I'm happy to answer. <laughs> yeah, but I, I did want to supplement your answer uh, to uh, the students and the TA as well in regards to, you know, uh, renewable energy being a, uh, at its core, a materials engineering problem. Um, and I think material scientists and those who think about material science in the context of their own engineering um, practices, I, I think that's really where we're gonna draw a lot of the solution from policy all, all the way to the um, engineering aspect itself. And um, th thank you for bringing up, you know, some of the work that we do in my lab. Um, and I don't want to, you know, obviously pitch it too much, but absolutely, this is something we think about in terms of materials and en engineers, right? We think about um, one concrete example is, uh, as you mentioned, the materials for batteries for electrification of vehicles and cobalt is a huge uh, pain point. Um, right now, mostly eight, 70, 80 percent of the cobalt mines are in, um, uh, you know, are in the Congo. And while you know there's no inherent issues with working with uh, international collaborators and international um, sources uh, to get the cobalt at at, on a, at a fundamental level, there are some geo, uh, huge geopolitical issues that we run into as material scientists in getting this cobalt out because there are many layers of who owns these mines, what are the uh, labor rights, uh, if there are any, uh, labor protection for the workers in the mines. And then of course, you know, then 
the the supply chain where we get it into the lab and then um, you know, engineer a component that works, right? An electrode that actually works and then getting it into a battery and then a battery stack. So yeah, at, at its core, electric- well, and, and also you have to scale this up problem. tremendously. You, yeah. need, right. you need order of magnitude, order, orders of magnitude more probably than, than right. what we have today. But, uh, yeah, just, uh, so just decreasing cobalt by, the you know, usage of cobalt by you know some small X percent really gets magnified when you think about the scale of things, A absolutely. Um, yeah. So. And, and the other thing I would add is, is just simply adding manufacturing capability takes enormous amounts of time. It takes time to have the people, the equipment, all of that set up. And, and you're, mm -hmm. you're seeing this, you know, something as simple as, as these nasal swabs for COVID, you know, mm -hmm. how, can, how can you not make enough Q-tips? In one sense, it looks very simple, but at the mm -hmm. same time, you've got to have just the right materials. You've got to have it qualified. You've got to get equipment from one place to the other. These things, these changes don't happen fast. Right. Um, despite a lot of good work, it, it takes takes tremendous time for these things to, to, to not tremendous time, but but you know years. It, it, you can't can't change on a dime as much as we'd like to. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, you, you've certainly given us a lot to think about. Um, you know, and I think that's a great um, tie. You know to all the materials science topics that we've, we've talked about and um, now taking into practice, what, um, regardless of you know, the uh, engineering disciplines that we all belong to. So, oh, I see, let's take one last question from the chat and then um, we can adjourn after that. Sure. Um. Yeah, so you know the, the financial resources are you know there, there's at least uh, re resources on many levels are, are important and uh, there's financial resources there's human resources uh, right now uh, you know in other parts of my life I, I've, I've dealt with some manufacturing policy things and one of the things we don't have is even enough people that really know how to build things we used to have lots of people that uh, would do tool and dies and electrical setups and you know it's close to construction but industrial uh, setting industrial manufacturing facilities is not not a trivial thing and we've been doing less of that in the united states largely outsourcing that and that's going to change we've i think found we have to be more self-reliant so doing things that have high quality and uh, are highly productive is going to be difficult here because we don't have a lot of manpower. Um, and then there's you know, the raw materials is, is an issue. You know, things like cobalt, other, other uh, rare earth elements are, are issues and finances are an issue. So it's, it's really, really difficult. Um, and um, yeah, and, and I think to to sum it up, yeah, I, I think MG, you you've you've got it about right. Is that uh, even even if we know what to do, getting it done is difficult for a bunch of reasons. Some of these are turning good policy ideas into action. Action has always been difficult, always will be difficult. And then the other is even if you are, are at that entirely. Um, you know, imagine what one of one of United States great technical triumphs was going to the moon, right? And and that took many years, and that was something like five percent of our of our federal budget for several years. It takes a lot of dedication to make these changes. So, um, not only do you have to commit to some of these things, you've got to commit hard. And um, I think it's a great time to be an engineer. Quite honestly, it, it, it remains to be. It, you, you, there, there's different problems all the time, but but, but really, really good ones. And um, I see we've, we've gone a little over our, our, our time. And um, if, if anybody has further questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer things through email and um, yeah, appreciate, appreciate the chance to be, to be able to talk with you all today on, on Earth Day. It's been, it's been my, my pleasure and honor to do so. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's been great uh, having you and sparing your time. So we appreciate it as well. And if we were, meeting in person, <laughs> I would start a, an applause, but um, I see some students are, have already thank you in the, um, in the chat. So, um, well, we appreciate your time.
Glenn. And um, with that, I'll um, adjourn the class. Okay, thank you all. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. Thank you.